everyone. Welcome to another episode of Happier at Home PRN. I'm so excited that you've decided to join us today. Uh, and we have a very special guest on uh, someone that I've grown to really love and enjoy his personality. It's very unique. And uh, he ended up uh, coming to me at one point uh, to talk about expanding into home and community-based services. So uh, with us today, we have Patrick Devro. He is a pharmacist and owner of FMS Pharmacy in Bessemer, Alabama. He is also one of our newest Happier at Home franchise owners. So I'm so excited to introduce you to Patrick. Patrick, welcome. I am uh, appreciate you joining us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. You are so welcome. And of course, we have Todd Yuri. <laughs> you know what? Um, extraordinaire. I, I just... I just like being fly on the wall, but I have to jump in quickly and make a comment about Patrick. Um, someone that has leadership in his blood and is part of the um, APCI board of directors. Um, APCI is one of our most powerful buying groups that really help to um, support community pharmacy throughout the nation. These buying groups are so much more important today than, in my opinion, than they were 20 years ago with what we're going through with with insurance and DIR fees and um, lack of revenue to keep our community pharmacies thriving. So Patrick, mm -hmm. your leadership is so important to us. And that's another reason I'm excited that um, that Debbie's talking with you about supplementing income, but also more important to me is delivering better and more services to your community. So um, thank you so much for being here and sharing your story with us. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for saying that. And you're also an NCPA member, as so many of us are, uh, and a member of the Alabama Pharmacy, Pharmacy Association, too. So I know that you um, get involved in many different things uh, for your own uh, personal and professional growth, but I think it's really important to bring those organizations uh, to the forefront so everyone understands that it's not just trying to run your independent pharmacy. There are so many different ways that you could get involved to advocate for your profession. Mm -hmm. And after all, that's what we're looking at today is really what Patrick's journey has been like and how he has grown uh, into uh, an entrepreneur and grown his pharmacy and started his happier at home company as well. Uh, so Patrick, I got to ask you, as you were growing up, what, um, what were you like as a kid? Were, did you have those leadership abilities already? Usually that kind of comes through, uh, naturally. I would say somewhat, um, wasn't particularly gifted at sports, so I wasn't really a, a sports leader, but definitely found myself in some, uh, leadership roles pretty early on, especially in high school. Um, and um, really uh, was part of how I got into pharmacy was actually was uh, uh, knew a, a friend of mine who knew how involved I was and some of the leadership things that I did um, invited me to apply for a job at his pharmacy at Eckerd Drug uh, in Palm Coast, Florida at the time. And so, um, you know, that that those aspects of what I was doing when I was younger helped uh, kind of get me on that on the radar, so to speak, with Mr. Guest and uh um, get hired by him at, at a very young age and started my journey in pharmacy pretty early. I've heard that from so many people that, um, you know, there's professional professionals, pharmacists, uh, family members or friends that have influenced uh, as they're uh, growing up and the different things that they do. So, um, so you actually are from Staten Island is what we were talking about and mm -hmm. uh, moved around, moved to Florida at one point. And um, how did you end up where, did you move to Florida with your family? I did. Yeah. We moved in the, in the early nineties to uh, just needed a change of pace. My dad needed a change of pace. He was a bond trader on wall street and, and decided mm -hmm. that we needed to be out of the city. Um, and so we actually owned a home in Florida and we moved there full time and, and he started working there in the early 90s, um, building his, his his business from there as a financial planner. So you had some role models um, with the entrepreneur aspect of it. Oh, definitely. Uh, yeah. Awesome. He, yeah. He, he, I remember the days of him. Uh, he worked 
some long hours back before all this technology we have now where he was cold calling in the phone book trying to build his client base, you know, and uh, starting over moving to Florida. That is tough. I remember the yellow pages. Mm-hmm. That's right. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Uh, so uh, then a- as you were growing up, uh, I-, I know we have an interesting story about um, a game show that you <laughs> actually ended up uh, being a guest on, but um, it makes me think about uh, the characteristics of a person, a child, even at that Mm -hmm. point of what makes you uh, being able to um, open yourself up and um, try new things. So um, is that something that you always were uh, known for just doing your own thing, trying different things? Definitely trying different things, uh, and I did uh, I did a lot of theater as I was when I was younger too, and I think that really got me comfortable in front of large groups. Uh, certainly has uh, got gotten comfortable doing uh, teaching over the years, teaching and continuing education, things like that. And so um, that part of my personality, I think, has always been there. I think theater played a, a large part in that. Um, didn't really think about you know when I was on television, I don't think I was particularly too nervous about you know being being on national TV at that age. Um, but did win some money on that show and actually did help me, uh, pay for at least a little bit of Sanford, uh, where I went to pharmacy school. So very good. So how did you end up, um, on this game show on wheel of fortune? Yeah. So, um, we got passes. My aunt and uncle had passes to try out. Um, my dad, and my grandmother had tried out and then they didn't wind up making it through. And so they sent a, a letter back to them. Um, when they were coming back to Orlando for tryouts again, um, and, uh, they, they sent a letter and said, Hey, you can, uh, bring a family member with you for family week. And, uh, so my dad brought me and long story short, I made it to the final round. He got cut at the semifinal round and we're just like, (laughs) now there's like 10 of us up here and I'm not, my dad's not here. So yeah. Um, but yeah, then they, they selected me to to go on. I thought it was going to be teen week, but we were on there for, um, my favorite teacher week. So brought a, a beloved teacher of mine from, from, uh, from middle school onto the show with me. He flew out there and I uh, was on the show with me and we, we, we won some money and had some fun and met, met Pat and Vanna. That's awesome. I have to say though, you, you would do have the personality that um, you could speak to anyone and speak to in crowds. And that was one of the things that stood out to me was your passion for just sharing your information, sharing mm-hmm. um, things that you're knowledgeable about. Um, even when you came to Rochester for training for Happier at Home uh, to launch uh, your business, I that stood out to me, sharing your ideas with our group of franchisees that were in training at that time. So um, I, I have to say, I went on to your website and I watched uh, one of your videos that you oh, yeah. have on the pharmacy website. So you're a natural. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. You are welcome. Um, so let's see. So you went to pharmacy school and mm-hmm. then when you graduated from pharmacy school, um, where did you, were you in Florida at that time? Did you go back to Florida to start working? No, no actually I didn't. And, uh, this, this, this is actually kind of funny too. I kind of fell into community and independent pharmacy by mistake, not by mistake, by accident. That's a better word. Uh, when I was in, in pharmacy school, I looking to join student organizations and I came upon NCPA and I said, Oh yeah, community pharmacy. That's what I do. I work for record. And then realizing that, Oh no, it's, it's independent pharmacy and independent pharmacy ownership. And I'm like, Oh no, that's, that's not what I want to do. I don't, I don't want to do that. Um, but, but stayed involved in the organization learned a lot more, um, and pursued at graduation, pursued a community pharmacy residency um, and actually uh, completed one in uh, in Atlanta uh, with Mercer's uh, School of Pharmacy and uh, two of my favorite mentors, Jonathan and Pam Marquis. I worked in their stores. Uh, Jonathan, I know, has been on a couple of the other pharmacy podcasts. I heard him on Bruce's show not too long ago. Um, and actually, we've remained friends over the years and have learned a lot. In fact, I would say I learned um, the majority of what I know about independent pharmacy from Jonathan and Pam, just being out there for a year and just being able to see how they did things. And at the time they had three stores and I'm not even sure how many they have now. Um, so, uh, so no, I, I, I took a, a somewhat non-traditional path and didn't, didn't take a regular pharmacy job right out of school, did the residency um, and uh, knew that I wanted to come back to Birmingham um, and pursue 
uh, an ownership opportunity out here. And so, uh, so I spent a year out there and then um, put an ad actually in the APCI journal that I was looking to come back and um, looking to come back to Birmingham. And, and then I was able to join uh, the group I'm with now, FMS, uh, came on as a pharmacy manager and pharmacist and actually kind of their clinical pharmacist when I uh, came back to Birmingham in 2006. They really didn't have a whole lot of clinical offerings. Uh, weren't doing uh, immunizations or durable medical equipment or MTM um, and diabetes education. So I was able to get a lot of those things started and kind of start growing into where they are today. Very good. So are you involved with one pharmacy right now? Do you have any others? Uh, so our, our company, uh, our ownership structure is a bit unique. Um, so I won't go into too much of that, but I'm the president of the parent company that owns the, we own four stores. Um, but I spend most of my time at the Bessemer location, um, which is where kind of our, I wouldn't say it's our flagship, but we do have our office where we run a lot of our back office operations um, out of there. So I spend most of my time dispensing in Bessemer um, and working in the office in Bessemer. Very good. You know, that makes me um, wonder about uh, expanding by uh, growing into additional pharmacy locations. Uh, what are some of the benefits and drawbacks of just expanding by additional locations. Yeah, and, and we did. Um, so when I took over as the president in 2017, we did uh, expand into a new location for the first time, uh, a startup for the first time in years. Um, and we opened in a uh, an area of uh, Birmingham called Hoover. <clears throat> That's where our, <clears throat> excuse me, our Rossbridge Pharmacy location is. And um, I would say the drawback is, is, um, anytime you're having to build something from scratch, you know, and, and try to build that customer base, um, it's always challenging. Um, you don't know what the reimbursements are going to look like out there. You don't really know what the demographic is going to look like. You don't really know what uh, what's going to work and what's not. So it's a lot of trial and error. Um, I will say, though, that um, utilizing a lot of the operational things that we've done as a company for the last um, 37 years, um, we've been able to, we were able to take a lot of those things and, and put them into place at Rossbridge and, and, and create a scalable model for growth. Um, but it's always a challenge. Now, I, I do say, I, I think that one of the things that we did well with that location is that we did put it yeah, into an area that actually has a, a, a relatively lower Medicare population. Um, and I know that sounds, sounds bad, but with DIRs and everything, which I know have been talked about a lot on the show, uh, that store actually has the lowest amount of DIRs, uh, by a, a tremendous amount. Um, so, you know, finding that location is important, but you don't really know until you get out there what that's going to look like, what the payer mix is going to look like and things like that and what models are going to work. Yeah, I know that's one of the things when um, we, and we went through this process when you were going through discovery with mm -hmm. Happier at Home that mm -hmm. you really need to look at the demographics of your uh, territory, quote right. unquote territory, uh, to understand what that household income is, um, especially with happy at home being a private pay uh, right. source of revenue. So, um, but I think uh, also what you're saying in regard to one of the benefits, if, if you can, if you've had the um, experience of starting up mm -hmm. a company, uh, let's say your independent pharmacy, you've had that experience really keeping track of how you did it, the processes involved so that it is reproducible for you. Right. So it's an easier thing to do. So um, that would be one of the recommendations, right? Make sure mm -hmm. you're uh, tracking, writing things down, mm -hmm. uh, keeping your contacts of how you started that uh, location so you can uh, take that model and reproduce it. And uh, Absolutely. then, like you said, then it's a scalable model also, and you're not having to recreate the wheel. Exactly. I'm, I'm, a, I'm definitely, uh, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Uh, if, if, the, if you found a model that works, that's scalable, that's reproducible, um, got to do it. Got to do yeah. it. I yeah. kind of want to let the listeners know um, the choices that our pharmacy owners are making going through this process with Debbie and her team, extremely data-driven. It's not a willy-nilly yes. thing. It's not, and I'll give you some information that that Debbie and Patrick, you may not even realize, but um, Health and Human Services from the state of Alabama, the division 
was called uh, Human Resources. So the Alabama Department of Human Resources at the beginning of the year made a public outcry that said, we're missing services for over 600 seniors throughout the state. And that's just on their, their surface and mm -hmm. um, audit. So right. home care services in the state of Alabama are so necessary. So Bessemer uh, being taken care of by uh, your community, Pharmacy Patrick, is so important. If if we picked any state, I'll bet you we could probably find the same news um, findings. And this was uh, WBRC Channel 6. Mm -hmm. um, and it said the, the title was Alabama uh, Department of Human Resources looking to add more adult care services. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is that that's the state saying, hey, this is an issue. And of course, they're probably making it sound a little bit better than, than maybe even the condition is. But that to me is a shout out to our Alabama based community pharmacies to, mm -hmm. Hey, let's, let's get involved in this. Yeah. And there is actually had a meeting with the area on aging last week. Um, and there is such a need right now for programs that they have, but also just, you know, private programs and companies like ours. Um, they are, um, they, they are so, I don't want to, I don't want to use the word desperate because I don't want to make it sound like they're going to sacrifice quality just for quantity. Um, but there is a, such a need that, I mean, we had one meeting with them and they're like, well, what can we do to talk about getting a contract with you guys to do some services? We need more home care businesses to be able to do this, but we also need quality. And uh, so, um, yeah, that need is, is was very apparent after that meeting that I was like, I, I barely I've barely met them and we're already talking about <laughs> about about this kind of thing. So, um, yeah, it is it is tremendous throughout the state right now. I Absolutely. think that one of the things also is that you're bringing in credibility because you are in the community and have that connection with the community through your pharmacy as well. So you have um, have that credibility to bring. Um, and it, this is one of the things that, you know, the numbers of seniors are growing. And um, so when potential happier at home business owners contact me and they say, well, you know, there are other home care agencies in our area and, you know, there's a lot of competition. The thing is, is that the number of seniors just keeps growing. Right. And um, even though there's that competition, there is going to be competition and mm -hmm. that would be across the country. Right. Um, the leg up that you have as independent pharmacy owners is that you have that um, that respected reputation within the community. You have the people coming right into your door that are potential customers of yours, mm -hmm. you know? And so instead of you saying, hey, you know what? I know that you haven't been able to um, drive and come in here or mm -hmm. follow your doctor's orders or mm -hmm. come in and get your point of care testing. We can help you. We can right. help you with those programs. So um, it, is there a way or do you have some kind of plan um, mm -hmm. moving forward with um, connecting your pharmacy services with your home care company, with your home care at home company? Yeah. And just like you mentioned, it is a crowded market. And um I got a little nervous at first, you know, understanding that it was a crowded market, but I, uh, and, but the more and more facilities we visit, the more we realize if, if there's this many independent living facilities in the Birmingham area, there's still a need. And um, there's a few big players in our area, um, but our secret sauce, if you will, uh, our, our messaging that myself and I've got a great business support manager named Shasta that we stay on message on is you need a pharmacist involved in your home care. You've got to have a pharmacist involved in the home care. Aside from the services that we can provide having a pharmacy, just having a pharmacist involved in aspects of care is what's getting the attention right now when we have conversations with stakeholders. I had, a, had one this morning at the Jefferson County Department of Senior Services that that's like that that's different. There's really only one or two air, um, companies in our area that have any kind of credentialed health provider as part of uh, the structure at all. Um, maybe part time or whatever, but most of these uh, companies are not owned or don't have any any credentialed health provider involved in it. So having a pharmacist involved um, is really where we're we're hitting our message. So just looking at drug related problems, um, you know, when we're taking on a new case to see if there's duplications, interactions, things like that, or if the 
if the if, if our if our employee may re report back to us, hey, the Smith is having this, this, and this going on, that could be a drug related problem that we can potentially help solve, even if they don't fill their prescriptions at our pharmacy, um, because just having that level of expertise and knowing that is our is in my opinion our competitive edge. So we lead with that in all discussions that we have. Because um, I, I jokingly say, hey, you probably get 50 phone calls from companies like mine a week. Here's why we're different. And this is where we can be an advantage for your seniors um, to recommend us. You know, So uh, one per, per facility last week was like, can we have you come in like next week to talk about not mixing alcohol and medicine? That seems to be a big problem at some of the independent, one of the independent <laughs> livings and things like that. It's like, yeah, I mean, I'm ready to go now. You know, we're going to talk they about that happy hours. this Wednesday. Yeah. Do you know that, that they'll have happy hours at the senior centers? Oh yeah. Yeah. I love that though. <laughs> yeah. We went into one, uh, not too long ago that was having a Kentucky Derby, um, uh, party. So they had the hats and the mint juleps and all that stuff happening, <laughs> happening all throughout. So they had, uh, uh, March madness. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, it's nice. It's enjoyable. Uh, you know, it's great for that socialization, but mm -hmm certainly mixing it, mixing alcohol yeah. or different yeah. types of, uh, you know, grapefruit juice, different, different types right. of things that you should be avoiding for, uh, with different medications. I I'll never forget one of my first patients when I started my happier at home location way back in like 2007 was a gentleman who was 90 years old and, uh, he was having an allergic reaction to something. Well, he mm -hmm. went to, I don't know if it was an urgent care because they weren't very common at that time, but whomever he saw told him, oh, just take Benadryl every eight hours. Well, he never stopped <laughs> oh, and gosh. everyone was wondering why um, he was on the couch all the time. Mm -hmm. So uh, just being a registered nurse, at least uh, that was something that I could troubleshoot. So I, I know that that is a unique proposition that you have mm -hmm. as a pharmacist and pharmacy owner to be able to, to bring those things to them. And, you know, also as a happier at home business owner, you're uh, able to provide that medication management in the home and medication management solutions too. Mm -hmm. So our pharmacy has done a, a great job over the last several years as being, being branded as a, as an adherence destination. Uh, we have, we've, we've been utilizing different systems for a long time to make sure patients have the right medicine at the right time. Um, honestly, for the last several years, it's probably led, um, our referral sources for the pharmacy were, were referred to when patients are referred to us and we find out, you know, who referred you and what, what kind of things they were looking at. Um, most of it's medication adherence. We've done a pretty good job getting our, our word out there with providers in our area. So this was a natural fit and extension for that. And one of my plans is to also explore um, a little bit more about the medical at home model, uh, where certain patients that meet certain criteria um, that were blister packaging and delivering their medicine that are not able to leave their homes if they meet criteria and their pharmacy benefit manager allows um, the medical at home, uh, then we are going to explore that. We're still learning a lot about that. Uh, mm -hmm. our, our familiarity uh, with um, with uh, with billing and things like that has is uh, limited mainly to traditional pharmacy and long term care pharmacy, which we do have a combo shop um, pharmacy, so that for patients that are in facilities that we service, we can bill under that NPI number. Um, so we're still learning that. So we're hoping that we can expand that as we learn more about medical at home to our patients that are that are either at happier at home or or maybe they're not. They're just our existing customers, but meet that criteria. Um, and as you mentioned, you know, providing immunizations in the home, potentially point of care testing, um, things like that, um, you know, is, is part of the plan as well. That if that if there is a need, we can meet that need and and have a pharmacist go in there, then we will do that. Mm -hmm. And um, Bree over at the NCPA is a great resource for your long-term care uh, medical model at home uh, needs as well. Um, they're, they're wonderful. They really um, are such an incredible resource for any of the pharmacy owners out there. But I know uh, when you have those re referral relationships uh, with, let's say, um, assisted living, um, the transitional care units, those, uh, those referral sources for your pharmacy, they really need you. They mm -hmm. need you with the medication compliance, but they also need you uh, now that you're an own home care owner uh, to be able to help them with that 
safe discharge home. Right. So because it's a private pay source for you and it's a private, it, the patients are paying out of pocket. Um, it's, it's not a hit on the system and it also really helps the system. It helps right. everyone along the healthcare continuum to save money and right. of course, increase quality of care. So you, there's so many different ways that you are helping your, um, your community and the healthcare system itself. And everyone wants this. Everyone in the healthcare system wants our seniors to be as independent as possible. Um, and to be able to, I learned this term from you and Marie recently, the age in place, you know, and to be as independent as possible for as long as possible. Um, and whether, and, and I feel like we've been providing as a pharmacy, we've been providing solutions for that for a long time with medication adherence, because we know, and, and everyone, all of your listeners know, uh, how bad, uh, or how drastic the outcomes can be bad if, if, uh, medication adherence is not followed or mix ups and things like that. So we've always been playing a role in that, keeping seniors independent. Um, I believe, uh, personally, and I, I don't have a ton of data to back this up, but just from what I've seen, medication misuse is one of the leading causes that we've seen is patients not being able to remain in their home. Um, and so a lot of times we may be the, I hate to say last stop, but really maybe we are, if the patients are overwhelmed by their medicine, um, then we are able to provide a solution that works for them. And so now that we have home care, you know, uh, uh, that we can also possibly offer that as well um, as a, as another way to keep our seniors aging in place and remaining as independent as possible. Yeah, you definitely do. And and because you are that hub and usually see your customers coming in every month, um, at least once a month, probably, yes. um, you are able to see that those changes too. Or if they if if there's either a physical decline, you pick up on a cognitive impairment or something like that, um, you have that those unique assessment skills. Um, so it, you oftentimes are the first line of defense where you're able to pick up on these things and change the trajectory of that person, if they're going to, um, be able to remain independent and in their home or not. So absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You see those customers decline and you're able to, uh, intervene and especially like you said, the medication non-compliance causes, uh, I think it is the highest cause or the most common cause of uh, people entering nursing homes, mm -hmm. not even just hospitalizations, but right. nursing homes. Right. So, so it's a very we, important thing. Yeah. Well, one of the things we've also seen, even if we haven't seen a decline, we are so involved in our patients' lives as most independent pharmacists are um, that we know when a patient has a, a spouse or a family member or caregiver that's passed away. And now all of a sudden, we're like, what's going to, this question gets asked all the time. If, if we see someone who's passed away, it's like, well, what's going to happen with Mrs. Smith? You know, who is going to be able to take care of her? Um, Cause Mr. Smith, who just passed away, you know, he was the one that pro provided the primary care and, you know, we're, we're, we're very involved and we typically, we try to attend the funeral whenever we can for our customers and things like that. When they happen, we've just become, they've become part of our family. And so, um, so that's another thing we can pick up on too, is that we see, you know, is there, is there a need for that? Um, even if there's not necessarily been a decline, but now there's just a need for care. It's like what the family now has to step in and figure out how that's going to happen to keep mom in place, to keep her aging in place. Right. You know, that's a, an excellent point. And I always tell people, make sure that you're planning in advance and not just acting and being reactive uh, to a crisis. So I've seen it so often where one person is physically doing well, you know, of a couple and the other cognitively is doing well. And the two of them together are able to stay independent and stay together. But mm -hmm. um, right. I always like to talk with those families before something happens, because if they just get a caregiver in the home, one day a week for right. maybe four hours, at least uh, then both members of that couple can get used to that person, get to know that person and build the trust right. in your company. This way, when something does happen, then they can, you can just uh, seamlessly increase the hours and um, you won't skip a beat that way. 
Yeah. So with your, uh, with, with your pharmacy, what are, uh, I know you mentioned some of the services, uh, but you, can you tell us about the different types of um, offerings you have through your pharmacy? Absolutely. And uh, I'm going to give credit where it's due. I have an, an unbelievably great clinical pharmacist uh, at, named Anthony, Dr. Anthony Bolas, um, and uh, has helped us really transform our clinical services into something great. So our main non-PBM services that I, I like to call them, I kind of group all of our clinical things under, they're still, we're still may still be billing insurance, but we're not billing PBMs. Anything that doesn't touch a PBM has got my attention. Uh, so um, Anthony leads our, um, we have an accreditation for diabetes education. So we're certified through ADCES as a diabetes education provider. Um, Anthony and I are both also CDC trained lifestyle coaches through the national DPP program. Um, and we're actually currently offering that program under an umbrella organization right now. Um, we uh, very involved at MTM as much as possible. Uh, our immunization program has always been robust. Um, we were very early with COVID vaccine and, and we were in the community as much as possible. Anthony was working, we were all working crazy hours trying to keep up with the demand when COVID vaccine came out. Mm -hmm. um, so our vaccination program has always been something robust and uh, adult vaccination program uh, particularly. Um, and then um, the other big part of our clinical offering is that um, our state allows us in uh, for our state and local government employees to go on site and provide biometric screenings where we do a finger stick, um, check their lipids, check their blood pressure, their BMI, um, and uh, they they get a wellness discount for participating in that. Uh, we're one of the largest providers as a pharmacy in the state. Uh, we actually travel all over the state. In fact, we're, I'm going to be on the road for a week in July, um, going to some municipalities in South Alabama and providing those screenings. And so that's been a um, tremendous source of business for us. And we're always actually looking to grow that and scale it to other self-insured employers, um, employers that can benefit from our services coming in. Um, not just that, but the diabetes education, diabetes prevention, immunization programs. So we're in the process right now of, of working, and Anthony and I are working on ways to scale that part of the business. Um, you know, the long and short of it is really just trying to maximize what's not going to a PBM right now mm -hmm. uh, is our strategy, uh, was, was part of why why we, why you and I started talking to, you know, so uh, it's just anything that doesn't touch a PBM has my attention. Very good. So when you're doing these screenings, uh, what, what do you do with the abnormal results? Are they, are you able to continue on with that patient in any way? So what makes us a little bit unique there um, and most, all the pharmacies in the state, there are some other providers that do these screenings. Uh, what makes the pharmacies unique is that we usually provide some education at when, when we get the results as far as understanding what medicines they might be taking that are affecting that and things like that. Now, when we get abnormal results, if they're at a certain level, um, it actually triggers a referral um, to the for the patient to take to their provider. Um, they actually are able to take that uh, those results to their provider and the provider may want to do a, a, re a repeat test, um, but they get an actual um, free of charge office visit to the doctor um, so they can discuss the results. Um, they can, you know, do, do see if medications need to be adjusted and things like that. Um, and since most of the screenings that we do now, it's, it's really shifted. We used to do many of them in the pharmacy, but most of our screenings now, we travel around and do them offsite. Um, I would say it's uh, almost 90% of the screenings we do are on the employer site um, at these different municipalities. So we don't necessarily have access to medication records. And even if they were coming into the pharmacy to do it, um, if they haven't told us which medications they're taking, we, we might not know. But usually when we get abnormal results, we start a conversation with the patient about that to, to understand um, which medicines uh, are affecting what. Um, you'd be amazed how many times we've heard, well, the doctor put me on this new cholesterol medicine, so I stopped my old one. And so that's an educational opportunity for us. So actually, those are supposed to be used together. They just mm -hmm. may not have communicated it to you that you're. it's not replacing it. Um, so, you know, uh, we, we do spend a lot of time talking through that. Um, as a pharmacy, uh, as a pharmacy group going to these different, uh, different provider sites. Very good. Do you do the diabetes education yourself, uh, in the stores or do you have a nurse working? Uh, no, I, Anthony does all that. Anthony oh, is our clinical does. pharmacist and does, and I, I did for a long time. I was the primary instructor, got us through the initial accreditation process with diabetes education. Um, and then when we hired Anthony, uh, back in 2015, um, he sort of took that over as as his full one of his full time responsibilities. Um, he oversees all of our accreditation. Um, my 
expertise in that area has more to do with billing. So I actually consult with a couple of different states and, and, and one national organization to help pharmacies uh, get credentialed to bill diabetes education and diabetes prevention services. Um, it's a, it's very nuanced because we don't have provider status. So you have to have to be uh, very, very, very uh, strategic about how you credential. Um, so mm -hmm. it doesn't project. Um, it'll, it'll all get better when we have provider status. That's what, that's what everyone keeps telling me anyway. So, <laughs> but uh but yeah, so no, I, I I no longer provide it myself. Uh, Anthony does the majority of that, um, and uh, on, I'm just going to be honest with you. He's so much better at it than me. <laughs> I'm, I'm a halfway decent teacher. Uh, he brings a level of enthusiasm that is just unmatched. I'll just say that. Well, maybe I'll meet Anthony when I come yeah, into I so. Birmingham. Yeah, you which... have. To. We have to schedule that. I'm going to, yes. I'm on it. That's yeah. on my list. I'm going to well, come and a, see you um, guys. And... An interesting fun fact, Dr. Anthony Bullis um, is a fellow podcaster as well. He is. He did some work with Samford's University uh, McWhorter, uh, McWhorter School of Pharmacy. Yeah, he did the healthy dose, healthy dose for a while. So I was a, a listener of that. So a shout out to oh, go cool. Dr. Bullis. <laughs> yeah, I had a lot shout of out. fun. I've been a guest on there a couple of times, had a lot of fun talking about, um, actually the last time I was on there, we talked a lot about the Medicare landscape and DIRs, but really also not, not just that, because our listeners for that were more than just pharmacists. So we we're trying to tell the public, you know, what, what some of the changes were with Medicare, with why readmissions, as you mentioned, Debbie, you know, yeah. uh, we want to keep patients independent. So why do readmissions affect that? Or why, why do they affect your primary care um, your primary care, you know, has metrics now they have to hit and they, they get penalized if you're not doing certain things. So we spent a lot of time on that talking about that. Very good. So one of the things I always am interested in is the types of things that you might have gone through that were mistakes or challenges mm -hmm. along okay. the way in your business development um, I know your happier at home business is on the early side, but um, I think that a lot of those lessons that you can learn are transferable Absolutely. Uh, to different situations, What, no matter what business you're growing or mm -hmm. the way you're expanding. So can do you have any challenges or mistakes that um, you can look back and say, you know what, I learned from that? And, you know, what would that be? I think that in this business, and I know several people listening, we we have seen, and I've I've been a you know licensed pharmacist for next month will be eighteen years, um, and we've seen, especially on the independent side, have seen a lot of the next new thing, the next big thing, um, and we've chased a lot of rabbits. <laughs> um, and so, in terms of mistakes, I think it's more of what I've learned from we we've, we've chased a lot of different clinical initiatives, we've chased a lot of things that are going to, you know, transform how we're supposed to be able to practice pharmacy. And there's been a lot of things that have, that have been really, really good. But I think um, there's, there's been several um, software relationships and clinical relationships that we've tried to have that um, has built, try to build more collaboration in certain areas, which we actually have been able to do eventually. Um, but back in the day when these things were coming out, it was like, this is, this is going to be the next big thing for pharmacy. I mean, if in 2006, um, and I was, I was actually, I remember sitting in, uh, at Mercer's school of pharmacy with Jonathan and Pam for a continuing education on Medicare part D. And they told us that MTM was going to be so big that you were going to have to hire like three pharmacists to keep up with the, with the, the level there. And so while MTM has been very robust, um, it's not certainly been at the level where we would have multiple full-time pharmacists doing it. Now that's not necessarily a mistake we made, but that goes to the larger point of, we have to step back for a second, take it with a grain of salt, analyze the things, the data, like you talked about earlier, that we can put our hands on to see what kind of resources do we need to put to this. Um, so I know this is kind of a general question or a general answer to the question, but um, I would sum it up by saying that there's been you know several different clinical and, and other business initiatives that we've looked at that didn't pan out. But I think it was largely because they were unproven concepts and because... Mm -hmm. That's what um, I was going to say. We were really, um, you know, we, we approached it cautiously. Um, we didn't put a whole bunch of money into things or things like that. But, you know, we're told, hey, this is, you know, this this program or this partnership or this whatever is going to be the thing that transforms the practice. And again, there have been several things that have. But um, I think the unproven concepts has probably been the biggest mistake where it's like, you know, let's 
let's talk to others that are that have made it work and, and see before we start putting any kind of not just money but time and resources into developing this you know who who in the area has made it work uh who especially in alabama alabama is very backwards when it comes to what we're allowed to do as pharmacists um, not as bad as some other states but still pretty limited in terms of scope of practice so it's like you know an unproven model you know, it doesn't, mm -hmm. doesn't always work. So that would be my mistake there to sum it up, to say unproven models, evaluating the cost effectiveness and return right. on investment, things like that. And I think that just having your um, education and your business acumen behind you, um, you could look at those things and just, you have uh, a gut feeling or intuition about it. Mm -hmm. And right. you have to take that into account right. and don't discount that at all. Um, looking into the future though, um, what what do you think is on the horizon for your uh, pharmacy as far as growth? I think it's going to be a tremendous amount of growth in the the space where we can offer employers. Um, not necessarily just drug pricing necessarily, and that's not uh, what we're focusing on, but um, as, as we've seen in the business that that part's becoming more and more commoditized. And so I'm trying to grow and have been for years trying to grow areas of our business that rely on the pharmacist's clinical and cognitive ability um, that are able to deliver value to the healthcare system, particularly self-funded employers um, and improve outcomes for patients. So we're our, that's where we're going. That's where we're putting resources I'm not saying we're not trying to grow prescription business or anything like that. Mm -hmm. We obviously would want that too. Um, but, you know, we have a choice every day in terms of what to focus on and where we need to put our energy. And uh, our core business has been and always will be pharmacy and dispensing. But um, if we can put resources toward other areas that deliver value, that give us a competitive advantage, but also maybe a business that no one else is doing mm -hmm. uh, and be able Sounds to create like a, a stream there, then we'll do it. Yep. Well, you have a lot of unique things that you're doing and focusing on these large employer organizations is a great idea. Um, at least you have a point of contact to reach many people. So, right. you know, every time I talk to one of our guests, I always take little pieces of information that I could use in my own business. And I think that that could be one of them, um, you know, as a franchisor and owner of the national company, I think that it, engaging with these employer groups is a great way to be able to reach employees, uh, employers and thereby employees that can really take advantage of having that education of what sources or resources are available to them, including uh, home care, because how many people are missing work because they have to exactly. take a leave to take care of their own parent. Um, so where that can be feasible, sometimes it's not always the best for uh, all involved. So that's going to be mine. I take away from this conversation. So thank you for that. But so Todd, any uh, closing comments or questions? No, I'm excited about community pharmacy getting uh, deeper involved in in home care services. Um, happier at home. Uh, you pick the the right partners in community pharmacy owners because of the care and the pride that they already have for their communities, and this just adds another layer of services that the community needs. Every time I go to the news, and every time we have one of these uh, episodes for Happier at Home PRN, Debbie. I'm finding more and more data out there that um, that screams, hey, we need more home care services in our communities. I agree. And Patrick, it, it does, you know, I remember starting my my original location when Happier at Home had no name and now we're mm -hmm. recognized, right. but it is, um, it's scary at first, but uh, as an entrepreneur, it's scary in a good way. Uh, you know, just keep doing your marketing and um, exposing all of your referral sources to the additional services you can provide and everything is going to take off. You're going to be very excited to see that. You're going to be providing an incredible uh, service to your customers and your community too. So, all right, well, Thank you again for joining us. I really appreciate it. Um, can't wait to see you in person very soon. Very and soon. Uh, I think we could wrap this up for yeah. this month. And for more information about Happier at Home, 
please go to happieratomefranchise.com. Once again, that's happieratomefranchise.com. And um, we, we so much appreciate the information that you bring to us every month, month after month through Happier at Home PRN, Debbie. And um, Patrick, Thank this you. was a... This was a treat to talk with you and a shout out to Thank Anthony. You. you have to tell him that we we listen to him. Sure will. Absolutely. Yeah. Great to see you, Patrick. And Thank Todd, you, you as usual. All right, guys. Have a All great right. one. Thank Thanks, you, you too. All, All right. right. Bye-bye.